Later on, I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians, and uh, after the Armenians uh, got a very rough deal at the Versailles Conference. CBS Television, in cooperation with the United Nations, presents the United Nations Casebook. Tonight, Chapter 21, Genocide. In the darkest pages of the dismal history of man's inhumanity to man, you will find the story of the greatest of all possible crimes, genocide. At the United Nations General Assembly in Flushing, Dr. Ricardo Alfaro of Panama said, oh, The crime of genocide is a matter of international concern. Yes, the punishment of the crime of genocide is a matter of international concern. What is this crime of genocide? Everyone knows what homicide is. One man kills another. We have laws against this crime. Police to arrest the criminal, judges to try him. Genocide is the crime of persecuting a group because of nationality, color, religion, anything. But with no international law, millions were simply arrested and corralled like cattle to be branded and slaughtered. Continue Dr. Alfaro of Panama. Many instances of such crimes of genocide have occurred when racial, religious, political, and other groups have been destroyed entirely or in part. Principals and accomplices, whether private individuals, public officials, or statements, are punished. How? Uh, genocide is a new word combining the Greek word genos, uh, genos meaning race or group, with the root of the Latin sidere, meaning to kill. The word genocide first came into use in 1946 at the Nuremberg trials, but the crime that genocide describes is as old as man and his recorded history. Many men, many races, many cultures have fallen victim to genocide. Let's pass a few examples in review. Herod, fearful for his throne, ordered the massacre of the innocents. His attempt to kill all the male children of the house of David was a clear case of genocide. At the height of the Roman Empire, Nero tortured and threw the early Christians to the lions with the intention of destroying this religious group. The Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century used bloodhounds against the Carib Indians. This too was the destruction of a racial group. Holland's trees bore strange fruit in the 16th century when the Duke of Alva's court of blood doomed 18,000 Protestants. On the night of St. Bartholomew, the 23rd of August, 1572, a wholesale massacre of many thousands of Huguenots took place in France. The night before, the Huguenot leaders had been guests of King Charles IX at the royal wedding. His hospitality included taking pot shots at his guests. The next day, his mother, Catherine de' Medici, contemplated with satisfaction the Huguenot bodies which littered the palace doorstep. When crime is not punished by law, it is answered by vengeance. In many parts of Europe, Catholics were persecuted and decades of religious warfare followed. In America, the Quakers were beaten in the streets of Boston. In attempting to smother this sect, the early colonials were guilty of genocide. In 1822, 100,000 men, women, and children were killed on the island of Chios. Their only crime was that they were Greeks. Modern man, too. Man in the last 100 years has been guilty of this crime of group murder. Choosing so-called modern reasons and using modern methods, men of our own time have persecuted and destroyed other men, singling them out because of the group to which they belong. We all remember some of these instances, do you also think of them as cases of genocide? Yes, 
These folks are not playing games. They're running for their lives. Men on horseback, it doesn't matter much who they are. Let's say they're modern cavalry out on orders of their commanders. They're huntsmen on the chase. Only the prey doesn't happen to be a fox. The prey is people. These were the victims. They are Armenians, and the place is Asia Minor. But that doesn't matter either. They could be anyone, anywhere. Of course, it mattered to them. Nearly two million of them were driven from their homes to perish in the desert or die before they got there. Why? Well, the reason given was that they were friendly to the enemy of their rulers, that they were a fifth column, that they were spies. Every one of the two million of them. Long before World War I in the Balkans, thousands of Serbs were dragged from their homes and massacred in the streets. The same tragic fate befell the Bulgarian peasants of Macedonia. This was willful destruction of an ethnic group. In 1921, the Greeks of Asia Minor were again fleeing for their lives, victims of the crime of crimes, genocide. We come now to the most recent and by far the most efficient examples of genocide in all history. The crimes committed by Hitler's Germany before and during the Second World War. The Third Reich arrogantly classified all Germans as members of the master race, so-called, branding all other peoples as inferior. The Nazis applied the tools of modern science to systematic and skillful mass murder wiping out millions because they worshiped the wrong god, spoke the wrong language, or honored the wrong flag. Think back a few years. Because this man lived, because of Hitler, a few people followed him. Millions died. His own people and those who fought them. People too young, too old, or too sick to fight. People outside the fight, but inside groups which Hitler and Hitlerism declared unnecessary or undesirable. The Germans didn't like gypsies. They found them an inferior race. And so the Germans, everywhere they went, shot and hung and burned gypsies, 500,000 of them. The master race didn't care for Poles either. For one thing, they were in the way. And when the Germans needed Lebensraum, room to live, they broke the leases of the tenants with a bullet and the noose. Though sometimes, when they were in good health, the Germans let them live as slaves. Of the inferior Poles, of the in-the-way Poles, of the slave labor Poles, the Germans killed two million. And then, then there were the Russians. The Russians didn't stand in very well with the Third Reich either. They fought back too hard and they didn't fight like gentlemen. The women and the old men and even the kids, like these, had a most annoying way of getting into the argument. Of the civilian Russians, and the women Russians, and the old men and boy Russians, the Germans killed five million. And then, and then of course, there was the ancient scapegoat, the Jew. A people as good at hating as the Germans couldn't pass up this bet. Hitler was ranting about the Jew before he made his first headline, and when his chance came, he made good. Of the lucky Jews who were promptly shot, and the unlucky ones who were vivisected and incinerated and just plain tortured, six million died. The world was seeing, the world was feeling the impact of genocide. The impact of genocide, yes, with a vengeance. And now, this is a concentration camp, a nice name for a bad place. The fences kept the campers home, and the high-tension wiring kept the fences effective. Look out, dangerous. 
After a while, a short while usually, because of the accommodations and the service and the cuisine, the fences were academic. There was nowhere to go, no desire left to go, no strength with which to go. There was just one sad fact, and you could camp around and concentrate on it. You were still alive. These are liberated prisoners. The American soldier looking at them fought his way there to liberate them. But as far as this group was concerned, he fought in vain. They'd been liberated before he came. Nuremberg, Germany, 1945. Before a tribunal representing the United Kingdom, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States, Associate Justice Robert H. Jackson, Chief American Prosecutor, put in his case against the leaders of the German conspiracy to destroy civilization. It took 10 months, 1,000 hours of sessions, over 200 witnesses, 5 million words of testimony. 21 defendants were in the dock. In the absence of a law against genocide, these men were charged with crimes against humanity committed during a war. 18 of the 21 were found guilty of such crimes, but the court could find no law covering the crimes committed before the war began. The crimes committed by the Nazi party against sections of the German population, the crime of burning books, destroying culture, debasing groups. This international trial at Nuremberg and the international war that preceded it at last focused world attention on the need for an international law against genocide to prevent the repetition of such horrors and to ensure punishment if they should ever be attempted again. And so the world lifted its voice through its one great international body, speaking for almost two billion people, the United Nations. At the League of Nations, legal experts failed to take any action against the crime of genocide. But in December 1946, the United Nations General Assembly, meeting in New York, proclaimed genocide a crime under the law of nations and instructed the Economic and Social Council to prepare a draft convention on the international crime of genocide. The Economic and Social Council drafted such a convention in 1947 and submitted it to the Paris session of the General Assembly in 1948. About two months ago, in the beautiful Palais de Chaillot in Paris, the convention was passed, 55 to nothing, said President Herbert Evatt. I would urge, and I think that's the spirit, the unanimous view of the assembly, that this convention be signed by all states, ratified by all parliaments at the earliest date, in order that basic human rights be given the protection of international law for the sake of progress, social and international peace. One by one, the representatives of 21 nations signed this new document called the International Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. Rather dull title, a very scholarly paper, but a big step on the long journey of people moving toward a life of order, justice, and peace. After the document had been signed, it was sealed by Assistant Secretary General Ivan Kernow. the document was delivered. Good news went out to the world. We now come to the discussion part of our program and our three guests, uh, whom I'm going to introduce to you right away. Uh, the first, you just saw a minute ago in uh, his official capacity as uh, Under Secretary and Assistant Secretary of the United Nations in charge of legal affairs. Uh, Dr. Avan Cano, uh, put his seal on this uh, document, on this declaration about genocide. Uh, Dr. Kenno, could you tell us briefly uh, where this document is now and what happens next? The document is now here in Lake Success with the Secretary General of the United Nations and is open to the signature of all the members of the United Nations. We hope that many signatures will come and that not only signatures but ratifications will be done. Because, as you know, the Convention will come into force as soon as 20 ratifications are in. 
I see. And now, speaking of ratifications, that brings us to our next guest, uh, Representative Emanuel Seller uh, of Brooklyn, who's been a member of Congress since 1923, a Democrat. He's now head of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, you're going to be very directly interested in this uh, convention, uh, uh, Mr. Seller. What uh, do you think the uh, chances and prospects are uh, of its uh, ratification uh, by our Congress? Well, I do indeed hope that the United States will be among the first nations to ratify the Genocide Convention because the United States, uh, because of its tradition and uh, its history, uh, should be among the first to ratify. Uh, whether it will ratify is dependent upon um, what the Senate and the House may do, to, also depending upon whether the administration will permit ratification as a treaty or ratification as an executive agreement. If the ratification is of an ex executive agreement, then all that is required is a majority of both the House and the Senate. If the ratification shall take the form of a treaty, the uh, uh, ratification of a treaty, then uh, the treaty must be presented to the Senate where a two-third vote of the Senate is required. Our presidents and our secretaries of state have had bitter and heart-rendering experiences with treaties, and uh, on many an occasion, uh, treaties have not been ratified by the Senate. You may remember the very uh, harsh treatment that uh, President Wilson received with reference to the Treaty of Versailles and uh, with reference to the uh, League of Nations. It embittered, it embittered the experience, embittered uh, uh, Wilson, and uh, in all likelihood was a contributing factor to his early death. So you would hope that this treaty would uh, perhaps get through, uh, not by the Senate, but by this uh, uh, method of uh, 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 majority vote of both houses? I hope that will be the procedure. I, uh, I like to call to mind uh, what uh, Secretary of State Hay said with reference to a treaty going into the Senate. Yes. He used this language, quote, a treaty entering the Senate is like a bull going into an arena. No one can say just how or when the final blow will fall, but one thing is certain, it will never leave the arena alive, end quote. Uh, I will, of course, play some part in the uh, ratification if the executive agreement method is used. If the other method is used, namely the routing of the uh, treaty uh, through the Senate, I will not play such an important I part. I see. Well, now we come to our third guest, uh, Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who is a professor of law at Yale University and specializing in teaching uh, matters about the United Nations. Dr. Lemkin is the man who created the word genocide and really uh, has fought this thing from long, long ago. Uh, Dr. Lemkin, could you give us a little background on how you came to be interested in this genocide fight originally? Gladly, Mr. Howe. Uh, it leads me very far back to my childhood. Everybody has sentimental memories from childhood and everybody has a book he loved most. One of my inspiration in this field was a book by Sienkiewicz, Quo Vadis, which described the terrible sufferings of early Christians. Later on, I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians, and uh, after the Armenians uh, got a very rough deal at the Versailles Conference because uh, the criminals who were guilty of genocide were not punished. You know that they have organized a organization, a terroristic organization, which took justice in their own hands. The trial of pa Talat Pasha in 1921 in Berlin uh, is very instructive. Uh, a man uh, uh, whose mother was killed in the in genocide case of uh, killed Talat Pasha. And he told to the court that he did it because his mother came in, in his sleep and incited him many times. Uh, here is a murder of, of your mother, you don't do a thing about it. And uh, so he committed a crime. So you see, uh, as a lawyer, I thought that uh, a crime should not be uh, punished by the victims, but should be punished by court, by international law. And you took it up uh, then again when Hitler came to power in Germany, didn't Correct, you? Correct, in 1933. And there was not a big case of genocide yet who, which uh, uh, interested me, a big case in the Near East, and I would like to mention the country. There are two cases in 1933, and then I said uh, to myself, now being a lawyer, I'm going to do something about it. 
and I have submitted a draft convention uh, to a committee of a conference of legal experts, which were connected with the League of Nations. And however, uh, no action was taken. And then, however, but Hitler took action, and that precipitated countries of the world to do something about it. You had to wait till the United Nations was established to get the action that has finally resulted, didn't you? I would say partially something was done about it in London when I was an advisor to into the American prosecutor and we wrote in the genocide charge in, in the Nuremberg indictment. Unfortunately, the court did uh, took a restricted rather stand on genocide and uh, punished on the crimes committed in connection with war. So, uh, as far as genocide committed in time of peace, uh, as strange as it might seem, it was still a lawful thing. And therefore, you, I tried to interest the United Nations, and I have approached three delegations, the delegation of Cuba, Panama, and India, sponsored the resolution, and then we start the ball rolling. Well, that brings us to the United Nations and to Dr. Kano, who is an official of the United Nations. I think some people who've watched this program may think that the United Nations officials are just bureaucrats sitting back at desks. Dr. Kano, won't you disillusionize us about that and tell how you got to be interested in genocide? It's uh, not a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty grim story, I know. Uh, the answer is very simple. You know that I am of Czechoslovak origin. And I think the name of Lidice is very well known to every American. Yes. And so you see that if Hitler had won the war, so not only the Jews, but surely all the Czechoslovak and all the Polish people would have become victims of genocide. And you, during the war yourself, were uh, in the French underground, is that right? Uh, yes, because I managed to escape from Czechoslovakia, but I could not escape from France, so I had to live there under German occupation, and of course I work, worked for the right cause in the underground. Well, now I'd like to get around to the United States, because I think a lot of American listeners want to know uh, some things about this convention, which I think uh, Congressman Sella can probably answer better than anyone. Uh, does this convention, Congressman Seller, become binding as soon as it's ratified, uh, become, become binding upon us? Well, there's a provision in the uh, convention that uh, asks the contracting parties uh, to um, implement uh, said convention uh, to provide effective penalties for persons guilty of genocide or any other, other acts enumerated in the convention. Uh, there would be a moral obligation on the part of the United States uh, to pass legislation once it ratifies the yes. treaty uh, to implement it. And is there any uh, American tradition that supports our endorsing such a uh, proclamation, declaration as this? Oh, I, there, there undoubtedly is sufficient tradition for that, uh, for the ratification of that convention. This country was built up by men and women who fled religious persecution in Europe, killing and torturing members of religious groups was not new at that time in Europe, uh, when we, when we, when the founding fathers gave us our constitution, uh, that is the reason why the American people and the American leaders always disapproved of barbarities of the sort that just has uh, just been flashed to the uh, uh, television audience on the screen. Uh, President Wilson, a great democratic leader, tried to save the Armenian people from genocide during the First World War and shortly thereafter. The American people, without uh, distinction of party affiliation, have poured, poured forth millions to help victims of genocide, both after the First World War and after the Second World War, and also at the beginning of the century. We were at the receiving end uh, with reference to the evils of genocide. We have to pay the piper, and therefore I would think that we should pass this uh, international statute, ratify it, so as to prevent a recurrence of a genocide. Well, now let's I know be... also, uh, Mr. Howe, that President Truman has uh, ratified, uh, President Truman has embraced uh, the declaration of genocide. Well, let, let's, uh, let me ask you one perfectly blunt question, if I may. How do you think some of the Southern uh, uh, Democrats are going to feel about this? Will they feel that this is going to be used uh, as another weapon against lynching and the treatment of Negroes in the South and all that, that foreigners will come meddling into their affairs? Well, attempts will be made to uh, give them that impression, but as I read the convention, and the history of the convention, uh, there is no intention uh, to make, for example, lynching a crime of genocide. Uh, genocide is uh, that which is directed against uh, a people, or an ethnic of group, the whole people, isn't uh, that it? in whole or in part, yes. uh, but that is not uh, involved in the, uh, in the crime of lynching. 
and uh, I hope that the uh, southern senators and the southern members of the House uh, will get uh, sufficient enlightenment on that score. How about the American Bar Association? They've been uh, uh, urging us to go a bit slow. Uh, what's, what's the angle on that? Why are they taking that attitude? Well, I'm not sufficiently clear in mind as to the what's underlying the American Bar Association's uh, attitude. I don't think they say uh, uh, dogmatic, uh, dogmatically that they're opposed to the convention. They asked for a mature reflection and an extended time for study. Now that may be a dodge and a stall, I don't know, and it may be a facade to cover uh, absolute opposition. Uh, but uh, I, if that is the case, it is just the old uh, strain of isolationism uh, that's uh, running through the confines of the Bar Association. Do you think that this convention should have more teeth in it than it has in its present form? I think the convention has, uh, has got a good deal of teeth in it, uh, but uh, I still think that it would be well for uh, the United States, once it ratifies it, or once other nations ratify it, uh, to adopt implementing statutes. How do you feel about that, uh, Professor Lemkin, about the teeth in the convention? Do you feel that it's uh, strong enough now in its present form? I would say it's strong enough. A international treaty must be made in such a way it's acceptable to the entire world. Uh, it's not unilateral uh, business. So uh, 57 nations have transacted. And you have uh, a number of very important provisions, like the uh, provision of, about extradition, the provision about the uh, obligation to punish uh, by domestic courts, and then the very essential provision uh, of, uh, of supervising the implementation of the Convention by the World Court of Justice in The Hague. And now the authors of the Convention didn't want to run into new institutions, they wanted to use existing institutions, familiar to the entire world, as to, so as to make the acceptance of the convention more easy. Well now, uh, Dr. Kano, uh, you were there when the convention was finally uh, passed 55 to nothing. Will you just say a little about the significance of that extraordinary vote? I was very much gratified that on this important question, unanimity was obtained in the Paris Assembly and that there was no East-West division. And among the first 21 signatories, you have not only the United States, but you have, for instance, Yugoslavia. So you see, it was really the unanimous wish of the Assembly. And uh, Representative Sell, I think we're going to have a North-South division on this. In the well, I hope there'll be none. As I said before, if this matter is properly debated, and uh, a real intelligence is brought to bear upon the subject, uh, there should be no uh, rift. And uh, I do hope for an overwhelming vote uh, in uh, both houses if the uh, agreement method is used or in the uh, Senate if the treaty method Thanks is used. very much uh, to all our three guests, Dr. Lemkin, Dr. Cano, and Representative Seller, for taking part in this discussion of the problems of genocide. To become law, the Genocide Convention must be ratified by 20 of the parliaments of the world, by the National Assembly of the Republic of France in Paris, by the Supreme Council of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics in Moscow, by the Parliament of the United Kingdom of Great Britain in London, and by many others, including the Congress of the United States of America. This means that you can help outlaw genocide, so think it over. You are a member of the United Nations. You are a citizen of a member nation. You can help wipe out genocide.